what we have now is the new chapter and the new birth is this group. And I would love us to work more closely with the community, honestly. One thing Ilya in particular wants to really do is have more of a genuinely transparent culture where we actually work more in the open with the community. So it's less of this sudden shakeup, sudden surprises, sudden shifts. That was David Weinstein, Chief of Staff at the Near Foundation, also known on the streets as the Enlightened Individual. This was an incredible episode because David is probably one of the best people to comment on the recent leadership changes at the Near Foundation, but we only really covered that towards the end. To get there, this is a wholesome, holistic exploration of the individual, classical philosophy, society, waves of technology and how they intersect such as crypto and AI, death and rebirth of everything from the individual, corporations, nation states and what happens when machines don't die. We get deep enough that we eventually uncover our own hero's journey. Warning, David had a hard cut off and yeah, it definitely feel like the conversation was just getting started. So let's call this part one of David Weinstein and hope that we can get him back on. Without further ado, I'll let you enjoy this enlightening conversation with Sir Weinstein. Bye. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of the Wild User Interviews podcast with me, AVB. Today, it is an honor to have with me David Weinstein, the Chief of Staff at the New Foundation. Welcome, David. Thank you, AVB. Excited to be here. I love the podcast. I love what you've been doing. So yeah, super, super excited to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind of you. I love the work that you've been doing at the foundation. I take it that you're the responsible for all the firings and hirings that have been going on. Mostly the hirings, I would say. I'll take some credit for that. But no, yeah, I get to work cross-functionally with all, all the different teams that we have. We have an amazing team. So it's incredible to work with all of them. Nice. Yeah, I, I feel like chief of staff is usually one of those roles that the name gives you an idea of what it is, but there's probably a lot more to it that probably most of the people are not exposed to. What does your day look like on a daily basis? That's a good question. And I actually think the name doesn't really actually represent at all what the day to day actually is. And maybe it's my own personal uh, take to it, where I, I come from a more analytical background, where I've led analytics teams and I've worked in strategy and, and finance uh, in the past. So I try to take more of that, I would say, to, to the role. But in many ways, the day-to-day, -day, I historically worked very closely with Marie, obviously as CEO of the foundation, and now more closely with, with Chris and Ilya. And in many ways, I act as like a generalist, help them in their day-to-day, -day, operationalize things, think through things, strategically explore things, et cetera and then do a bunch of more ad hoc and special projects. And that's more of the chief of staff type stuff. But then on the analytics side, I also lead the analytics team in the foundation. And we're building out more and more analytics as a public good for the ecosystem and, and also for internal uh, operations as well. So that's a taste and it can definitely dive in more. Um, Interesting. In competition. I will probably double click more on the chief of staff role at some point. Yeah. Plus, I have to confess, my interest in having you on, and actually by the time that I booked you, I forgot what your actual role was. You're one of those people that come across on Twitter a lot, and you have entered my radar. You've risen to prominence, not through your title, which may not actually describe what you do, but through a lot of your content and your reasoning, especially it's refreshing or perhaps a bit more unusual in the Web3 space. Because you tend to go back to the classics. There's a lot of introspection, philosophy, I don't know, stoicism. Your actual Twitter bio says no Thizel and some characters that I assume are Greek. So yeah, I'm fascinated to see how you got into this stage of life of self-exploration and societal exploration. And then how all the roads around like crypto and philosophy and history and the future, how it all blends into someone that may be able to influence the foundation and the ecosystem. So where should we start, David? I don't know, but let's dive in and we can see where it takes us. Yeah, and I appreciate the comments also. I do try to explore everything as much as possible. One of the things I think about the most is just be curious and be open to all of experience. And so trying to always 
admit that I don't know everything. I don't know a lot. None of us know a lot. And so there's so much more to explore. So having an open mind just in everything is just like a, a, a general way I live my life, just be open to the unknown. When did you adopt that philosophy? Because my university, Monash in Australia, the Alma, what's it called? The motto, it's Ancora Imparo, which is like always learning. And yeah. coincidentally, this morning, I read the chapter on Always a Student, mm -hmm. uh, on the Ryan Holiday book, Ego is the Enemy, which is very much what you're saying. It's having the humility to keep an open mind and all the pitfalls that come with assuming that you know things. But as I've seen in my own journey, it's easier to plaster it everywhere on the university merchandise or to just mm -hmm. even repeat it because you know that it's out there and it's in a book. Usually it takes a personal experience or, or, or there's almost like a, like an awakening process if, if the term woke hasn't destroyed that expression for people. So I'm curious how you found yourself into that space or, or what made it click for you? Great question. I completely agree with uh, the frame there. So for me, I'll say, I mean, taking a big step back, like growing up, very analytical family and upbringing, very into math. Growing up in university, studied economics and finance, got a job in finance after school at Capital One Bank in the US, where we spent, yeah, just hours after hours just going through the data to, to optimize our credit card portfolio at the bank. Very analytical, very logical, and all of that. And while it was somewhat like interesting, like intellectually to dig into those like math problems, it felt very empty at the end of the day. Like the entire purpose was just to maximize like very slight profit margins on a massive credit card portfolio. And so it was like so much brain power and so much emphasis just on tiny marginal gains. And it felt just such like a waste of intellectual uh, potential just to optimize credit card returns. And so I got very burned out of that and left the East Coast in the US to move to the West Coast to San Francisco and got into tech, worked in startups and was trying my path through that to, to think or to find like more meaningful work. Spent nearly a decade or so in Silicon Valley, various startups, various tech companies, always searching and never really finding what it was that I was looking for without knowing what that really was. And then, I don't know, I'd say like around probably COVID Time frame, but like maybe just before, met a bunch of really interesting people and got more down into different like rabbit holes around philosophical side of things. Like the fact that we really don't know much as humans and logic and science and all these things, the tools that we have are incredibly powerful, but they're not really helping us understand meaning or wisdom or the bigger questions. They're just like really sharp tools to optimize. They're not really good at asking the questions, only answering them. And I've had this, you said awakening earlier. I, I wouldn't necessarily go that far, but something like that did happen where I was just like, I, I woke up from the fact that analytics, math, logic, rationality, et cetera, is powerful, but incomplete. And there's so much more out there. And so the past two, three, four years has been that quest of what else is there. And how do we go back instead of going deeper or, or, or instead of going like more into the numbers, how do we take a step back and view the whole landscape with more breadth? And that's been my search of late is just what are the questions and how do we even begin to ask the, the, the better ones? The challenges that I find in discussing these topics is that you very quickly enter into a territory that it's easy to dismiss because maybe the journey is so personal that for someone that is not in that journey looking from the outside in it just looks crazy as you're speaking i'm like oh san francisco philosophy i can just visualize in my head there's like fire trailers in firemen and like the ayahuasca and, and it's it doesn't mean that it's wrong or that there's not a there but i'm curious on that spectrum of more holistic spiritual like internal and maybe on the other end of the spectrum we can have like more societal, pragmatic, maybe back to first principles, but with a very tangible problem or maybe like a more tangible outcome in mind, like where did you find yourself or, or, or how has it evolved over time? Yeah, maybe very practically or at least somewhat more practically. I started thinking a lot about our society, broadly speaking, our systems, our institutions, et cetera. And 
just really trying to understand the problems that we face as a culture, as a society, as a planet. And obviously there are like many just classic examples of this. There's environment, there's like polarization, there's economic, there's like things like COVID that come up, like terrorism, et cetera. There's so many just like global problems that are keep, that keep popping up and thinking about any solution to any of them. If you actually really think about those solutions, they end up like not at all, like helpful. Like it, it creates more problems. Like we keep trying to solve every problem in the micro local sense using the tool that we have, like we need more analysis, we need better science, we need, I don't know, more rationality, but none of that actually solves anything. And so it's, we're playing the wrong game. It seems like for real practical problems, like real day-to-day -day problems, we're playing completely the wrong game. Do you have any examples of perhaps a problem that we've tried to tackle? We had the wrong set of assumptions and how? Yeah. In COVID, <laughs> maybe is a fun example. Like we clearly something happened and all of our attempts at solving anything were very short-sighted and ignore so many other variables like lockdown type things seemed logical. It seemed rational at the time, but we completely ignored the impacts to kids in school, to businesses, to small businesses, to the economy at large, to so many other factors. And like we solved maybe one thing, like we maybe kept a few people out of hospitals, which was important or seemed important, but we just ignored the complete other, so many other aspects of, of social health, mental health, economic health, et cetera. And so we, we have these very micro-targeted solutions to holistic problems and that never, ever works. We need to think more holistically across the board for everything. Okay. I love it. So we're getting specific here. I think that's actually a really good example of that matrix that I mentioned. So if you want to go the full crazy woo-woo end, you're like, hey, it is not normal to have a very large problem and take into account only one variable mm -hmm. and then pretend nothing else exists. That opens up a bunch of layers, whether you're going up or down of conspiracy theories and what are the vested interests and who's really in control and why is everyone seemingly not seeing what's obvious. But then on the other end, you can have the more pragmatic, self-centered side where you can say, hey, the only way to combat this irrationality, whether it is the aliens trying to fuck us over or whatever conspiracy theory you can come up with, the only way to combat that is to really come back to the individual and to these principles that have been there for hundreds of years. And it's almost like a reset button, or at least it's the way that I see it. And that's actually when I started getting into stoicism a lot. I went through the whole COVID story arc of confusion and then what the fuck and then lockdown for two years. I was close to fucking burning down shit. And then I was like, nah, it's beyond my control. There's nothing I can do. And taking steps back and focusing on myself and like improvement and learning and, and, and working. Honestly, those were probably the two most productive years of my life. Mm -hmm. The day that the borders opened, I got my Australian passport and fucked off. But it's, it's interesting how it's very easy to get lost on both ends. I don't think I was dangerously close to the other end as well. Yeah. No, I feel the same way. In many ways, they were very, in the beginning, there was a lot of, again, COVID, like a lot of confusion in the beginning. Oh my God, it's, it's the end. What's happening? We need to all like protect ourselves and our communities, all of that. But then pretty quickly, I don't know, summer 2020 or whatever the time frame was, I had a shift where I was like, we're just like overreacting and doing all of the same. Like we're, we're really just fucking ourselves up. Like it's, it, it became way more like self-imposed pain as opposed to external pain. And I also had that same realization where I can't be too concerned about others. I need to focus on myself. And so I did have a very productive couple of years in a lot of just internal like work, like reading, thinking, exercising, like doing a lot of stuff for myself. Yeah. And I left definitely feeling like it was a very productive couple of years for me. and thinking about our solution, again, like the solutions to the problems that we have, or I don't know, we're not thinking multidimensional enough. We're thinking about one particular problem to solve, ignoring the other dimensions. And that pattern then I get like keep seeing everywhere. It's we focus on just one variable and ignore so many others. And so maybe to get into more like crypto potentially as like a potential area of, of solution, like a, a solution base, because to me, crypto is more multidimensional 
in, in nature. It's not trying to find one solution to one problem. It's trying to find like a collective type solution, like a multidimensional solution, which is super hard to even talk about. But yeah. Before we jump on crypto, yeah. where did you grow up? City? Uh, yeah, TC. Yeah. And where did you go to uni? Washington University in St. Louis. And which year did you move to London? You're in London now, yeah? I'm in London now. Yeah, yeah. So I spent, so I started working at the foundation almost two years ago. I was still in San Francisco at the time when I joined, but we're at heavily European centric. And so I was traveling back and forth a lot from the US to, to Europe. And so spent a lot of time in London and other places in Europe. But yeah, officially moved earlier this year to London. Hypothetically, if somebody were to be hired by the foundation, would you recommend them to consider moving to London or is fully remote okay? Yeah, it is fully remote, which is totally okay. In my role, I was working closely with Marie, who is based in Switzerland. And so just for my particular role, it was very helpful to be in the same time zone as her. Plus, I was also just, again, going back to maybe the way beginning of the conversation, just a deeper need for exploration in my own life and just being more open to new things. I also personally was very excited to travel and just explore new places, new cities, new people, et cetera. So I was very just all for that. But yeah, you don't need to be a Europe <laughs> to work there. I was moving. I was already going to, to Switzerland. It's funny. I've, I've always said that I'm very bullish on the UK mafia. There's you. I didn't know you were there. David Morrison, Marcus, what's his name? Ma Mark, Nakamiao Dao. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's just like a really strong cohort there. Uh, Jack CMO, Jack was there. Well, we'll count him as one of ours. At say by extension, even though I'm not really employed by anyone, Australia is like almost technically we're part of the Commonwealth. So I'll tag along there. But we'll take you. anyway, uh, bullish yeah. the UK mafia. Yeah, no, I mean, okay, look, also, I, yeah. No, please saying, give credit to where credit is due. I know that I'm probably missing people. It's like Chris Donovan, Bill Erner, Marie, because they are, or was there a bunch? Yeah, we had a really great crew. Yeah, because it's either uh, UK, there's like a West, like a solid West Coast crew. Right. That one's a bit more distributed, perhaps. There's Eugene the Dream in Seattle, uh, Mike Purvis, and a couple others in uh, Portland, Kendall in San Francisco. We should probably stop doxing people, but I think yeah. the Dira is in Los, An Los Angeles. It's, uh, it's good. It's a good contingent. Now, moving on to crypto, I think there's two lanes and it bifurcs, that's a word in English, but bifurcates into yeah. three. So there's a philosophy at the individual level, and then I see the technology as a enabler at a societal level. Level. So we've got this, let's call it classic philosophy. Then we've got crypto into the scene. But I also want to add to you, especially as you mentioned, that need for dealing with so many variables and complexity, AI, and how you see AI almost like a late entrant into technology. To me, it feels like we invented the, the steam engine and we've got trains, but that's not the train that we're going to have 100 years into the future. It, it, it's like a stepping stone. That's why I say crypto now. Mm -hmm. Now crypto without AI feels half-baked to me. But this is not about me. This is about you, David. I'd like to know <laughs> where you see that landscape or, or, or conceptually how you place things at the moment. Yeah, I would say the way I think of all of these spaces collectively and like how, how they intertwine. So I think of crypto in the most broadest sense is a way, is a novel way to arrive at consensus amongst independent agents like humans or collectives, et cetera. So it's a consensus mechanism at the, end of the, at the end of the day. AI, just to go there, and without getting too technical, not that I know the technical sides that deeply, but to me, AI is incredibly powerful at optimization, at uh, efficiency, at once you identify a problem or a problem space, it is extremely powerful, way better than humans are at getting the most optimal solution to that a specific problem, but you have to be, but there the trick is you have to actually identify the problem space, and then it can find you like the local maxima or the local optima given the constraints presented to it. But that only gives you local solutions or local optima in a topology like landscape that ignores what could be potentially the global optima or like other optima in a different kind of like multidimensional space. And I think to get to the more global solutions, you actually need independent humans, agents, et cetera, exploring 
more of the unknown space. And so I think they work in parallel or they work in, in a really good partnership, which is like allowing humans to be more open to explore the unknown. to so then bring it back with consensus amongst those agents to identify like a more or a different landscape. And once you have that landscape mapped out, you can then utilize AI to optimize within that known universe. And I think that's like an amazing combination there. You have humans exploring, humans coming together with other humans, and then using AI as a tool to maximize and optimize what you have discovered. And then that repeats over and over again. Have you been talking about this with Ilya? It's a pretty good, uh, you can put that in one slide. So it's like a, it's like a flow there. I think it's fascinating because as we've had a beautiful open AI saga, we've got four books worth of drama in a weekend. This is amazing. I don't need Netflix anymore. I don't want to get your thoughts on that later because as the chief of staff, I would assume that, yeah, I would assume that this would be the sort of things that you would have to deal with if there were ever a, a situation in here. But one of the analysis around the value of the models and people were speculating, can they just all fuck off and redo it in a new company? Can Microsoft have access to the data? Do they have access to the weightings? There was a lot of circulation and analysis going around. One of the things that I found fascinating is that, and I think Elon Musk said this around, around Grok, the real value and the real time consuming thing is cleaning up the data. It's assessing what is good data and what is just rubbish. Because depending on the data that you put in, that's going to be the quality of the model. So I think that an area would be, hey, we can actually use crypto for reaching the consensus of what is good data. Mm-hmm. And then you have the epiphany, like, oh, that's like how near was born in the first place. That's what near crowd does. Now, I do have to say, we've never had access to near crowd. No one outside of the four Russians have seen it work in the real world. But I have no reason to doubt it exists. And near tasks now, shout out to Jeff Bessinger, is working towards having this mass production. I've been part of some of the beta testing. And yeah. Yeah. I think, I do think, and I know that was a plan all along in many ways, right? Like the way Ilya and Alex first built near AI, but near crowd and some sort of the way they've been building everything in this, like this seeing into the future, like seeing the need for high quality data was going to be paramount very soon. And we're seeing this playing out now, like you said, with open AI and so much that like you can feel it's on the horizon. ChatGPT came out, it got to hundred million people using it like within the weekend or something. And then now you have GPT-4, GPT-5, whatever's coming next and whatever boots the open AI board enough to fire Sam and then rehire him. That whole saga was ridiculous in the past week. But we are, there's something happening in AI. Generative AI space is going to be extremely weird and it's going to create just infinite amount of data that the vast majority will be completely shit data, like fake or wrong or just manipulative, or whatever, just bad data. And so the only solution to that is going to be high quality data. And the question then is what is high quality and what does quality even mean? And these are some of the questions I got deep, I, I was deeply thinking about over the past three, four years, what does quality actually mean? Because it's not a quantitative thing. You can't measure quality. You can have like guides to it or like proxies for it, but like true quality in the human sense is not measurable. Anyway, and so I think quality is going to be an increasingly important topic, understanding quality. And I think that is exactly where crypto came in, was to, to create a, a mechanism to allow humans to explore quality together collectively to then utilize that with all the tools that are getting like rapidly more powerful. It's one of the concepts, and this is where philosophy and I part ways that I struggle with people like, oh, what's quality? I grew up in Venezuela and I studied law in Australia. And I can tell you, you know it when you see it. If you see a Mercedes Benz and a piece of shit crashed car from the seventies, you're like, nah, maybe this one has higher quality standards. Like it can be very application specific and it can be very outcome based. It's weird, especially the closer you get to quality, the more willfully blind people are. I've got some spicy alpha for you. I didn't know this, but I recognized her in a photo. I met and I interacted with, we were briefly in the same circle, Helen Toner, the main Mm. culprit behind the OpenAI coup. She is the epitome 
of the Australian left in my city of Melbourne, Victoria. It's this weird utopian idealism that completely ignores everything that led to the success we have right now. And it's just in a bubble. In a bubble of people that think the same and there's nothing better or grander than themselves. And to be honest, it's really hard to criticize her. At least it was 15 years ago and maybe up until she fucking sacked Sam Altman because you may disagree with them, but they're not doing anything evil. You're like, ah, you do your thing, I'll do mine. It's... It's noble. It's not like they're all Machiavellian worshipping Satan and stuff. They're just, there's a very interesting set of beliefs there. And, but yeah, ignoring what made you great in the first place, it's an interesting part. But yeah, I think that the conversation for me takes interesting tones because now we have AI president and AI governance. And you may have heard I was recruited by some very smart engineers to join a team working on this. We have a, they have a pretty good solution, pretty compelling, won the developer strike for the hackathon. And I've recently become aware of a new world of like technical capabilities, but also like how soon it is. Now I look at the NDC, it's mm-hmm. a disaster. And I'm like, yeah, if we keep those same humans there for 12 months, this is not going to work. But if we start leveraging the tools and the technology, completely separate stories. Yeah, I'm, I feel like the world around me is changing very fast and I'm just trying to keep up and... Yeah, it, there's a lot of things there. I think on the left point you were making, AI president, AI governance, et cetera. I think something like that is very close on the horizon. And I think the more we can be open to that and experiment with that and explore what that even means, the better for, for us and, and, for, and for, for everyone. I think we need, though, to understand that... Like, AI is not going to replace us. I think we need to make sure AI is in service to humanity and to people, not the other way around. I think we're dangerously close to giving up and just saying that AI do everything. But no, I think AI needs to be like in service to, and I think we need the humans to more like humans governing AI than AI governing humans. But I think AI is going to be amazing at executing and operating. It's just a need to be under the, like the under human kind of like governance. Can we think of any instances in modern history of any automation that has been seen by the publicly or in some way as being like worse than having humans do it? it depends on what you... Because I'm thinking everything from... Yeah. Because I'm thinking like things that I drove today, self-checkout at a supermarket, efficiency gain, even like Airbnbs. Now it's like smart lock. You can arrive at any time, just put in lock and you're inside. Like you don't, because that's a framework that I try to use. When I use ChatGPT, I imagine, okay, if there had to be a human on the other end, giving me the same information, is it a nuisance for the other person? Is it realistic that if I wake up at three o'clock in the morning, full inspiration, there's going to be someone there for me to give this to me? Realistically, no one fucking wants to do that. I think that the automation of things, it's always been a net positive and most people would be on the end getting some of the benefit. What I'm trying to identify is where does the resistance of the fear come in? Is it that we're transcending, automating physical things like opening a door and we're beginning to automate like thought or reasoning or something that may resemble thought or reasoning? Because I can tell you, I worked at a law firm, 80% of the work that lawyers do, it's not really thought or reasoning. Is basically pre uh, the same fucking contract and sending letters and extorting the clients to pay them thousand dollars an hour. Like it's very rare to have something novel where you really sit down and think about it. And, and honestly, if we had more human hours to sit down and think about these issues, we'd probably be like a hundred years ahead. Right now, it's just revisiting the same issue over and over again, so we can keep invoicing people. So I, yeah, I, I'm trying to understand or to think of ways to be an accelerant while also understanding the concerns, the grievances, how to build this feedback into the model. And yeah, I'm not sure as a, as someone that has probably had more interactions with the classic philosophy, where do you see the rise of the machines? And yeah, what would Marcus Aurelius say right now? I think though he was a stoic, obviously, and I, I saw you read or reading Ryan Holiday's books, which is all about stoicism in a modern frame. So I think, and I haven't read 
meditations in a long time. So I may not know exactly what he would be thinking right now, but I know he's very into the human, right? Like humanity, being able to think as a human, being able to feel as a human, being able to explore things as a human. So he's very not mechanistic in, in his thought. What he might say, or what I think about this whole thing is that yes, automation over, and, and beyond just computers, like the way we've been working for the past two, 300 years as a culture, at least in the West is on one hand, been nothing but progress, right? Like we've invented and discovered a million amazing things. We're making more and more money. People are getting wealthier and wealthier. We're, we're alleviating so many people out of poverty. But there's a million stats you can look at that show how much amazing progress we've had throughout the past, throughout history, but the past hundred years, 200 years, etc. And especially in the past 10, 20, 30 years, economically, we're making more and more money all the time. But while that's true, is that again, and this gets to more philosophy and people can be like, there's no good answer there, but does that even, does that actually really matter? Like the individual subjective experience, is that getting better for more people? Yes or no. And that's harder to measure and quantify. Like you, you were saying your law firm job, like 80% was just like going through the motions or just doing shit that like a machine could be way better. I don't want to throw them under the bus, but it's well, more of a statement of law in general. Yeah, 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 yeah. And even for me, like I, in some of my past jobs, like at the bank or in big tech, like most of what we did every day could be automated away. But yet we were the humans doing it. And most of the time we spent trying to occupy our time. Like we, we weren't like getting more time back. We were like, as things got more efficient, we were spending more time doing like less meaningful things. If that makes sense. Like so many meetings, so many just emailing back and forth, so much just like logistical things that seem to only exist because they exist. And it creates this like weird cycle of just like doing things just for the sake of doing things without actually pursuing novel thought or exploring new ideas. And our tool somehow, while they made us more efficient, they also made us more trapped in that way of thinking. And so to me, yeah, like in theory, yeah, if we have better automation, we can do more meaningful work, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And I think more people feel in general, like less satisfied, less fulfilled, less happy, while they are making more money and consuming more. But that consumption doesn't really seem to make them happier. So we see a lot of like charts showing mental health issues are increasing, right? Depression is increasing. All sorts of bad things are happening while we're, we're making more money and everyone's consuming more and getting richer. So that seems like a weird, there's a weird correlation there. There are certainly some human problems that money can't fix. I'll give you an example. Let's assume hypothetically that someone is really ugly and fat. Getting rich may even get you a partner. It may not get you love or it may not get you health. So it's, there are some things that are human and we can't bypass with money, despite what dirty marketers tell us. But you did implicitly bring something up, which I think is beautiful. And I may put words in your mouth, but superpowers in the way of new technology doesn't actually make a difference if you are a large established company or a large established government or a large established anything it could be just like old money. And then it brings the question of where is the place where new ideas go? Yep. Where is the place where the people that can regroup in the smallest possible group to use these superpowers to go and compete against a huge bank? Because I, I feel like that's the space that we're in. And I'm often very frustrated when crypto is all like Lambo money and meme coins. Look, it's fine if you want to do that on the side, because we got to have some fun while we, you know, reinvent the future of the open web. But I do feel like we've probably left a lot of value on the table or we need to rethink of our messaging because we want to attract the people that may be frustrated at a corporate job that are like high talent, high experience, and maybe have their own capital to put ideas to work. And we need to signal, hey, we've got technology here that could actually empower you to do a bunch of new things. Yeah. To reflect off that, what you just said, first of all, I, so, and many people, I think that go down more like spiritual paths end up like making ridiculous claims that like money is evil, full stop, or like 
we shouldn't be pursuing money at all. And I think to what you said, which I agree with, is that in many ways, money is more not good or bad. It's a tool, it's power, it's technology. Money is a technology. And so it, the question then is like, how do you harness that for something more meaningful as opposed to just it for the sake of itself, right? Like money is power. So where, what's the money serving? And when you have vested interests in a big company, big government, big anything, like you said, all they actually care about is their own self-preservation at the end of the day and maximizing their own growth. And they've been growing via a certain way for a long time. So the money that they make just gets recirculated into their own growth, which to be extreme is what cancer is. It's growth for the sake of growth, despite everything else around it. And you know what cancer does to the human body, it ends up killing the host. It self-terminates. And a lot of our older, more established institutions are acting in very similar ways. It's growing for the sake of growth, ignoring everything around it, and that's going to eventually destroy its own host. But that doesn't mean growth is bad or money is bad. It just means what is it serving. And to me, crypto, broadly speaking, is a new way to think about capitalism, a new way to think about money and growth and power, et cetera, but for healthier means. So it's more about the money is serving the host as opposed to itself. And so to me, the question then is, how do we harness that? How do we harness the power of capitalism and money and growth and technology, et cetera, to go back into its host, which to me is like the people and serving what people actually care about and want to happen as opposed to just itself. Yeah, but there's, okay, there's several things there. Let's see. So the first one is the free markets and Adam Smith. It's beautiful in its simplicity because it just describes that as like an invisible hand that will just sort things out. And that may be an oversimplification, but it's 100% accurate. See, the problem is that no one likes to extend the natural cycle of consequences of doing things long enough because the inevitable answer always is death, bankruptcy, collapse, insurgency, revolution. As you say, let's say, for instance, whatever, you've got a piece of shit corrupt government with a handful of people in the government stealing all the money. It's crazy that even themselves store all the money in a given currency. The people try to safeguard whatever money they can make in another currency. Like you can see the path, you can see the decline. You can see the path that they're going down. You can see it in health. Somebody has very unhealthy habits or they go down obesity, smoking, whatever. They eventually die. So I think that growth is definitely not bad. But there's something implicit in the growth cycle. But interestingly enough, the yeah. people on the left seem to be more acutely aware of it. Growth necessarily implies not infinite growth of one thing, but growth, death, and rebirth. Most people got stuck. They died and they never rebirthed. But yeah. even if you look at countries like El Salvador or even Portugal, there is a rebirth through them trying to attract technology money from taking very different approaches to governance, from just trying to reinvent themselves. To me, it's pretty crazy here in Porto. I walk around, beautiful, like along the river, you, you feel like you're in a movie. Every second, third building is abandoned, like literally just like wood planks and bricks. There's a lot of renovation now going on, but it's hard to imagine how such a beautiful city with such a great location has such an aging population. Everything is dying, decaying, and then you start to see the remnants of like new energy and new money come in. So I think that understanding that everything is cyclical in, in that birth and death cycle, it's important. And then you can overlay both the human and the, the corporation. The problem, and this may go back to our AI grievances, is what happens if you create a motherfucking machine that doesn't die? Yeah. What does growth look like then? Or, or, or how does a machine die to make way for another machine? I don't know. This is where I'm like, fuck it. I know we're in a simulation. I'm just not sure what the answers are. We, we've got to have Billy on the podcast. Yeah, hopefully one day. Um, no, I, I love what you said. I think that, so going back philosophically and spiritually, death, rebirth is like a massive part of all of that, of course. And I think for good reason. And I think you said something interesting, which is like Adam Smith, Invisible Hand, free markets, et cetera. And I, I do deeply believe in the free market as something beautiful and amazingly powerful to harness. I don't think what we have 
right now is the free market in any way. There's aspects of it, but we don't let things die, actually. And so if you're a major company, major bank, major government, like you really, like in the US at least, like you can't die. And so if you chop off the long tail risk of death, then the whole free market dynamics get completely fucked up. And that's why you have the term of privatized gains and social losses. 2008 banking crisis, all the banks did very risky things. They made a lot of money for themselves. They fucked up and then the government bailed them out, essentially. And then and now they're bigger, they're not smaller. They're more powerful, not less. And so we don't really have a free market. We just have this distorted view of it where it's a free market for the little guys, but then for the biggest players, they have a backstop. And that just completely distorts the entire game. I wonder how much of that credit card early institutional banking experience played into you coming into crypto and whether some of those early drivers were more on that DeFi alternative finance world. Because we've definitely seen another split in what crypto stands for. Before it was very heavy DeFi. If you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin is a big fuck you to that old world where banks can't die. And Bitcoin may well be that upper tier that says, well, banks may not die from their own death, like their errors, and the governments may stop them, but we can still kill the banks if we just stop being their clients. Like they just won't have any users or... Because now they use the term critically something bank. Like yeah. they literally do too much of the economy. But if we shift that elsewhere, then they're no longer critical and fuck them. So I wonder how much of that, yeah, how, how much were you drawn to crypto through that alternative financial world? Because now we have many verticals, including governance and AI itself. Yeah, I think a lot of it was definitely shaped by that. I think another thing, though, too, was more of like the Silicon Valley type mindset of innovation. And what I saw so, so often with myself, so it shows is very like self-directed, but also amongst like friends and people I worked with so much talent and so much potential was just, in my opinion, wasted in big tech companies where they're, these are like some of like the smartest people in the university, the most creative, the most innovative, et cetera, that just end up in a pretty, and this might be extreme, but just like a lifeless, soulless environment where they're just maximizing or optimizing. So I, I worked at LinkedIn and nothing against LinkedIn, but like amazing vision, amazing mission, amazing so many things. But then you get there day to day and you spend weeks, months, years just optimizing like click-through rates on meaningless ads. And these are like the smartest people <laughs> when they were younger. And they got so much talent and potential that's just, in my opinion, wasted by this like old system, old machine. And to me, crypto is like, how do we just harness more potentiality from individuals and actualize it and, and actually create new things, new ways of being, et cetera. Were you there at the same time as Alex Kiyoki? I think we actually did overlap for a year. I, I was there. But you didn't know each other? No, no, no. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have talked about that because we worked on, he, he worked in products. I, I worked in, in biz ops, but I worked closely with products. And so we had a lot of, we had some good stories that we share this past year. Interesting. He's, he's passed since, but I still like him. It's a great podcast. Uh, there's some general cool. product lessons and vision there. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that it applies to people's careers as well. Like the only way to keep growing as a person it's just to kill your existing path. I, I like that as a generation, we're much better at it. It's perfectly acceptable to be at a place two to five years. A lot of people may look at it through the wrong lenses, be like, look, I just want to have enough money to have savings for a rainy day. Maybe you, you buy a house. You want to have the safety net. But in reality, the real cycle is, have you grown as much as you can in that role? And then that's the launch pad for the next thing. Yeah. yeah. So I, a few Could. things that come to mind off what you just said. After, first of all, like the LinkedIn experience, just to go back to that, I think I learned a ton. Like it, it was a bit, it was valuable and it's not a bad use of time. So I learned a tremendous amount about what a very successful big tech company does and how they operate. 
amazing learnings there. But what you said though, is individually, you need to go through your own kind of like death, rebirth cycle. And so I was there for a couple of years. I learned a lot. I had to shed that prior experience and then do something new with it. And that's really, I think, valuable and powerful. So I think that is like the cycle you must go through. It's like you learn how you can, but then you have to let it, you have to shed. You have to kill that part of you and move on to the next to actually grow. And then something else I think you said. So sorry for the interruption. What were we talking about? That's in rebirth individually. Yes. I got most of what you said. And when I listen to the recording, it's going to be painfully that I couldn't reply to that immediately. But I did have a couple of notes. There is an interesting concept. Most developing countries, including Venezuela, have it around a brain drain. And at a country level, you're losing talent. But Israel has a really interesting concept around brain circulation. They actually encourage all their citizens to go abroad for a period of time and then come back and give back to local universities, local companies. Acknowledge that even though the individual's journey may take you anywhere in the world, it's actually an asset to have many people accumulating experience, but then try to make sure that the country benefits as a whole. And I think that in general, you can see many success stories there, even Intel, like your research coming out of universities, it's just a ton of stuff. I think an example is Yuval Noah Harari, the author of Sapiens and Homo Deus, 21 Lessons for the 20, whatever, Lessons for the 21st Century. He said the University of something in Israel now, but I think that he was overseas before. Anyway, brain circulation and yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I wonder, so that example with Israel, potentially where people might leave and then come back, they... There's maybe something that like they believe that there's like the mission or like the value to the culture or something that like they so deeply resonate with Israel as an entity that they want to come back to it. They feel like it's not just the religious aspects. It's more of a meta religion where they feel so they owe something back to it. So no matter where they go, no matter what they do, they come back. Whereas maybe in Western or in my own experiences, I don't feel any allegiance to Capital One when I was there. I left and I have not looked back since. Versus something like more, if it was more meaningful to me or if they did more for us or there's more subjective connection to it, it might be different. I don't know if that makes any sense. No, that makes total sense. I think that you would definitely need to find the layer where it is relevant to you. Like for instance, I would like to, I guess two things, uh, the most recent one first. I am. I wouldn't say against my will, but I would love to keep traveling. I'd love to spend more time in Europe, but I'm going back in January, early January. I'm very excited that the Dev Hub, shout out to them. Look at this beautiful jumper. They've put together Hackbox near campus, and I want to spend at least three to six months there. Going back to my university and other universities. I know they have innovation programs, and I know that I'm like the, the big deal, but it's almost like that journey of, hey, been traveling for a long time, been able to learn a lot in this industry. There's a lot that we can offer the students. And ideally, I'd like to see that ecosystem grow. Even though it's a fairly advanced ecosystem for such a small country, there's like that brain circulation in some ways. Even though this giant tax office, according to them, I never left. Another example would be, I see with Venezuela, as much as possible, I'd like to find ways to give back. My parents are still there. And yeah, if I could, do anything to help, especially in my areas of expertise or, or, or the experience that I've gathered. I know that people are, are the same uh, with either where the families are from or you could really find different configurations. You, you know which country is interesting as well? Estonia. Estonia has had some big companies that they tend to come back and they foster a startup ecosystem, transfer-wise, bold. There's several big companies that even though they now have offices in, in London and in other places, they're really being a big driver for local innovation and they inspire young people. There's just a lot of, they shape the culture in, in many ways. Yeah, it's interesting. What comes to mind from what you just said and the whole concept of recycling and going back to, I have been influenced again, more philosophically or mythologically about the hero's journey, which I'm sure you have at least heard of. Um, 
And but a part of the hero's journey is one of the most important parts is you go back to the beginning. You go back home with what you've learned and what you have gained. You bring it back to your where you're from. And that's that completes the cycle. It's not just going out and to doing the having the adventure and, and all of that. It's coming back home. And so that's mythopoetically, that's what we've been telling ourselves for all of recent history. That story. Interesting. How would the hero's journey apply or be different in the era of machines? If a machine finds an insight, like where is home? Where does it go? I don't know. I'm telling you, there's a few things that we're going to think through. Now, mindful of your time, I've really enjoyed this first hour of philosophy, history, everything. I do have to note for the record that we were meant to record live in Vietnam. We were both extremely busy, but you did buy me a coffee. Thank you. That was was very nice. And after Vietnam, there was what we may refer to as like a blackout period. Lots of changes at the foundation, very busy time. In the context of the foundation specifically, how much can you or do you want to share around those birth and rebirth cycles? Were you there during the Eric era or were you um, hired by Marik? Hired by Marik. So okay. when I joined, Eric was still around. So I got to know him quite well. But yeah, it was post Marik. Okay. Yeah, the floor is yours. You've yeah. had two CEOs. Yeah. Framing it in the death rebirth frame, I think, is actually quite healthy. Death rebirth is, I think, a very healthy thing. And Marie was and is amazing. Like I, I loved working with her. I worked with her before, actually, at Circle. So I came in many ways. When she joined, I reached out to her and was lucky enough to be given an opportunity in the, found- in the foundation. So I got to know her even better the past year and a half or so. She's incredible. I think she did a tremendous amount for the foundation and for the ecosystem as a whole. So I think we should look back on that with nothing but praise and, and, and positivity. Um, she has left and it doing, going to do amazing things both in the ecosystem, but also wherever she, wherever life takes her. But now it's time for, I think, a rebirth in many ways. Ilya is now the CEO. In many ways, that's his hero's journey. Like he never works in the foundation, but he obviously is a co-founder of Protocol. And him coming back to the foundation in addition to leadership, I think is a very healthy journey for him and for all of us. And, and then again, for all, in a more meta sense, then the foundation is now being reborn uh, with him as, as the leader and with Chris um, by his side. And I, I'm, I'm super excited for what this new chapter brings us. Um, I think the unknown is obviously, I keep saying the unknown is so uh, fascinating to me, but I think we are entering an unknown chapter, both individually, collectively in the foundation and then as a society at large. And I think the ability for us and the ecosystem to adapt to whatever comes is testament to the strength of us. And that's all that matters is being able to adapt, being able to look into the unknown, make sense of it, adapt and evolve. And so I think we went through the past two months. It was messy, obviously, but we, I think, came out way stronger. And I'm super excited to see what we do in the new year. So if you put it in the context, I love this burst, really burst analogy and the hero's journey. Fuck, I've been telling Jack he needs to hire me. So I'm right. not- that started as a joke, but I'm like pushing there. If we had to put it in the context of the hero's journey and we had to widely speculate, what do you think Ilya learned as he returns back home? What would those two first years provided for him or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I would say he, the past two years or so for him, he spent one of the years leading Pagoda as, as CEO. So he, I think, learned a lot about leadership. And he's obviously an extremely smart engineer. He built obviously incredible things, both the near protocol, but also as godfather of AI in, in many ways with his paper and his research at Google. So he's obviously extremely smart, but that I think is just one, one half of the coin, so to speak. And the other half is more of like the social, like the interpersonal, the leadership, et cetera. And I think he's been past the past two years really honing his leadership skills, honing his, yeah, just his interpersonal skills in general, his social skills, et cetera. And I think he's come back as a very strong, rounded leader. He has a technical side as always, but now he has, he can combine it with his social interpersonal skills to actually lead us in the foundation. And as a result, consequently, the ecosystem can benefit from his. 
him returning as a hero to, to guide us. I think that it is inevitable for anyone that goes through that journey of being a founder and leading uh, different organizations not to have growth. But yeah, their return as a hero makes sense. There are some shortcomings, not me, but some people have sometimes pointed out that he's not the best at delegating. He's better with smaller teams, often more technical. I do note that Marie did a great job cleaning out the foundation and bringing in her people. I didn't know that you were from Circle. I guess that's you, Chief of Staff, Jack, CMO, both from Circle. I don't know if there were any other trusted uh, recruits. If we had to... If we had to assume that the leader or the CEO would bring in trusted people from their circles and their experience, where do you think Ilya would hire from? And let's have it as a two-part series. Is he not going to hire humans? And we're actually entering the era of the AI agents and contributors and AI president in incoming. Yeah, I do think AI agents will be making an appearance in 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 part two of all of this to some degree. But that means. TBD, but I think in general, AI agents will be part of our global economy in the near future. And so I think us experimenting with that will be both fascinating, but also powerful. They won't replace us. I think humans will still need to govern them in many ways. And so I think humans will be doing that for sure for the foreseeable future. In terms of him delegating, one, one thing I, I hope to do with him and work with him on is be that extension of him and help delegate on behalf of him and help scale him, help operationalize him, et cetera, in the foundation, but then also more broadly in the ecosystem. And so I think I'm excited for that challenge. I think he and I have worked together in various ways for the past two years. And so this is a new, for us, it's also a new relationship more formally in the foundation. So I think we have some, we built a lot of trust. And so now it's how do we extend and, and do more? And so I'm super excited for that as well, personally. But yeah, AI agents will enter the scene at some point. And I think it'll be on us, all of us to think how we manage that and use it to serve us as opposed to us just serving them. One can only hope, yeah. only dream. And no. I guess the question in a lot of people's mind, and this really comes to the issue of there are some things that we don't really communicate until we do them. And then it's like, oh, that kind of came out of nowhere. Is it a natural sort of death and rebirth cycle? I think Marie in her blog post pointed out correctly. She came in, she did her job. We've got all these corporate deals and now somebody else is coming in for doing maybe more of the founder hacker side of things, more technical driven, Ethereum alignment, whatever. Is it just like a natural progression? Is there any hostility? Can we expect any more leadership changes? Yeah, sometimes the community is wondering, are we in support? Are, are we in factions? Like what's happening or what's, what's the vibe? If you can share or comment. For sure. What is the vibe? I think, so I think we have entered the new chapter. So I think what we have now is the new chapter and the new birth is this group. And I would love us to work more closely with the community, honestly, for sure. And have a more open, oh. One thing Ilya in particular wants to really do is have more of a genuinely transparent culture where we actually work more in the open with the community. So it's less of this sudden shakeup, sudden surprises, sudden shifts, and it's more of a collaborative process with the community at large, whether that's the NDC specifically or just the more, just the broad community for sure. But yeah, so the short answer is I wouldn't expect any massive changes in the near future. This is our group and we're coalescing around the new direction or not even the new direction, just the reframe of the direction that we've always had. It is more founder focused for sure. It is more developer focused. It always was, but now it's more stronger commitment to that. Founders, I think will be the focal point just move, moving forward more and more in our communication and our messaging. You were at NearCon, you heard both Chris and Ilya talk about that explicitly in, in their keynotes. And I think we'll see a lot more just really helping bring in new founders and helping them succeed. And that I think will be the ultimate focus for all that we do is get the best, amazing people from around the world to build the best, amazing things and actually support them, extend them, enable them, empower them, et cetera. And that will be what near is about. I remember when I was at university, international students, so very expensive, but I was able to get a job in this like bullshit program they had, digital transformation or whatever. It's one of the student engagement. 
Anyway, they invited me to this, like a conference, like a panel that they had for university staff. It was great because I was on the clock, I was getting paid. And the university is paid very well. Incredible waste of money. And they brought over this Canadian guy from his Let's see programs at Canadian universities. And he is super energized and he's laying out the plan and digital transformation. And all these things are changing, all this efficiency. And after his very energetic panel, one lady at the back, classic admin lady, she puts her hand up and she's, look, we've seen many like you come and go. The truth is there's people at this university that have been here for decades and they're just not going to change. And he politely told her, look, we're changing. Whether you change with us or it's time for you to move on, it's up to you. But this is the new path for the university. Funny, because I think the dude is actually not there anymore. And, and the old lady's one. But how many people do you think, or how much is the foundation optimized for being very corporate, very operational, getting those big deals? And how much does it have to recalibrate for being founder friendly? Do we have crypto degenerates in there? Are, are we keeping the same corporate people, but bringing on new people? Yeah. How much do we have to course correct or I don't know. How, how do you foresee the next six to 12 weeks? I wouldn't say course correct as if we need to go backwards or anything, but I do think it is a recalibration. As you said, I think we have. We set up a, an amazing foundation in the foundation, good structure, good operating principles, et cetera, built very good, like knowledge base of how things are, who, who the people are, what the projects are, et cetera. I do think though, we need to now leverage that in a slightly new, more focused direction and actually get more comfortable with the unknown, the chaos, the messiness, which is less about let's plan out the next three to six months and know exactly what's going to happen. But rather, how do we more quickly make sense of what's happening and adapt? So I think we might see more of a sprint model, like a, like every two weeks or every four weeks, like we identify short-term priorities and we just get the right team together to then really go after and accomplish whatever it is that we decide makes sense versus like the 12 month long, more like big tech kind of planning cycles. So the recalibration. We have amazing people, so I'm comfortable with who we have doing that. I do think though, it's going to be more like agile, more open and transparent, more async type principles, which is very different, if that makes sense. Engineering led, of course it makes sense. <laughs> I, I met the note somewhere, I think around uh, LinkedIn conversation. To quote old Eric Troutman, we're having a conversation late 2021 around me helping out with this role and I had some other initiatives. And he asked me like, because I had an idea or an initiative and he wanted me to help out in something else. But he was very subtle, but very good. He's like, is that the thing where you think you can have the most impact, or like the most leverage? And it was interesting because I stepped down two weeks after that. But to me, it was a reflection of, sure, you can do A or you can do B, but right now, what could have the most impact in the ecosystem? Like maybe you do something else for six months and then there's a new team there or a new foundation. So I feel like that is definitely the right approach. It's interesting because Eric had that right focus at the individual level, but my experience with him as well, especially those last three months of 2021, he was too analytical. Like he was asking for data that we just didn't have. It, it, it was clear that the foundation should have been operating more in like startup mode, just create a hypothesis and test it. Like we just don't have data. We can't be data driven. There's just no data. So it, it was interesting to see the transition to a new CEO shortly after and Mary doing what she's best at, bringing in the corporates and making it irrelevant or, or like proving that the technology works in that use case. But yeah, slightly two years after I, I would have liked to see it, but I'm personally very excited to see that founder era and uh, yeah, see what's in, what's in store for the future. Now we, we're going to enter the rapid fire question. This is usually part two of the podcast, but I've been told you have a hard cutoff. So we'll see how we go. First one for the people, the unenlightened ones, you know who you are, you dirty bastards. If somebody were interested in learning more about this philosophy, stoicism, just trying to learn more about some of the topics that we've been discussing, what would be some entry points or some resources that you could recommend to people, if any come to mind? The simplest thing is being curious. 
And that might sound too simple of an answer, but it's questioning everything that you think you, that you think is true. Like, why do you think that is true? So begin with that, begin with being curious, begin with asking why, and then following your interests, wherever it takes you. And so there's no like prescription for this. It's just be open, curious, ask questions and explore. It's a classic Buddha saying, if you ever see Buddha in the middle of the street, run him over. I don't think that's exactly what the saying says, but the, yeah, the message here is not to revere authority and to always revert to you and your individualism and your curiosity. That's good. I will add a couple. Let's cheat here. You're the guest, but ayahuasca and DMT. I've heard on, on, on several podcasts out there. Have you ever tried anything like that? Neither of those. Psilocybin. So like mushrooms. MDMA. Also um, not recommending, but have heard that they could be also expansive in how you perceive everything. I read it somewhere online that they're great for depression and microdosing. Yeah, it's, it's where curiosity takes you. You know what I'm saying? Okay, like, hey, next one. You've been a fantastic guest. I think it's great for the community to get to know who is actually working at the foundation, especially after two years of turnover, leadership changes, etc. If you had to recommend guests for the podcast, they could be a foundation, they could be anywhere in the ecosystem. Who do you think would have a good story to tell, insights, anything to share that could enrich in the community? So definitely a, a plug, I would say, but at NearCon, I, I hosted a panel around collective intelligence and, and how we can harness the collective to make genuine change. On that panel were three guests. One, Mally, who many of us obviously know. Um, she works closely with Ilya at Pagoda. She was an amazing panelist. So she'd be an amazing guest as well. And then two others, one, both are close friends, but one, Tom, he is ex-Wall Street. So had his own hero's journey. In many ways, he was Wall Street 10, 15 years, had his like quarter life or midlife crisis, and then found a lot of the same things I am interested in as well. And he told that story way more elegantly than I do. He's been on a lot of podcasts already telling similar stories. So he'd be amazing, actually. Then the other panelist was this guy, Nick, the founder of Factory DAO, who is all about building DAO tooling. He, he's been deep in the theory of the ecosystem. He's increasingly, thanks to NearCon, is increasingly interested in Near and how incredible the technology is and the community is. So he's thinking about building a lot on top of Near now in the DAO space. So he might be another amazing guest to think about. That was one of the most smooth plugs I've seen in a long time. I'll make sure to link the panel on the show notes so that people have the pleasure to go and see it. And I may or may not go see it myself and then take a peek of one of the three. But uh, those are good suggestions. I think we yeah. need that variety of thought and, and leadership. Definitely. Yeah, I couldn't agree And then final one. If the community would like to get involved or provide feedback, ideas in this new Thunderlet era, sprints, etc. What do you think would be the best ways for them to do? We genuinely want to be more open and transparent in this new kind of chapter. How to get involved specifically, I think. So what one thing I'm probably going to be helping lead in the foundation is essentially all of our initiatives will be more shared publicly. And each of those initiatives will be ideally built on the boss so everyone has access to it and can leave questions, feedback, concerns, thoughts, etc. And so that will be open to the public to actually see what we're doing, how we're allocating our time and pension and, and capital, and we want feedback from the community. So once that's more live, I will definitely share it with you and with everyone, and people should check it out, look at it, provide commentary and feedback. Until then, though, reach out to me. I want to be more open to all of you. And so please feel free to reach out any, in any possible way, which maybe I'm asking. <laughs> Probably a mistake, but yeah, definitely a good job to me. Yeah, yeah, good luck. Uh, <laughs> no, that's great to hear because I, uh, Alpha from the Ecosystem Roundtable has been reaching me for a long time. I, I tried to join in March in person at East Denver, not invited back then, awkward. And then I joined just for the first time a couple of weeks ago here in Lisbon. Great seeing you there as well. And it was an interesting experience. It was, it was underwhelming because... 
you have the self-selection bias of people that are already successful doing their thing. And the thing that I sense from that group of projects leading in here is they're just frustrated that there's not more people doing other things. So it's just a lot of rambling and there are insights in that group. I almost felt like I had a different energy or insights from someone that hasn't built anything yet. Like I want to go out there and get things done. You could just sense from this founder, it was like, hey, like, why are you asking me? Like, I'm already doing all the work. And if you have no direction, then what the fuck are we doing here? So it was an interesting experience. I think that more of those feedback mechanisms, especially on the sprint mode, where we can like really try things and power people to try things. Yeah, would be great. Yeah. Sir, I guess we're on the clock. Yeah, last thing I'll say on that point specifically, it's one of my, I I mentioned at the beginning, but something I deeply believe in is that I don't know everything. We don't know everything and we need more input. It it can often be too much input and it's hard to decipher what's good versus bad input or the signal from the noise, so to speak. But I deeply believe that we need more input from more people, more perspectives. And then the trick is then how do you synthesize that into actionable things? And that is what I am committed to is that it's, the synthesis of diverse perspective to like recycle back into operations and have this like iterative process to actually grow and evolve. That's the only way to actually grow and evolve. That's what collective intelligence actually needs. And so we need more of that input. So I'm definitely committed to that. Because yeah, I've been, if you go back to the governance forum, even back in the day, I shared the Dragon Bridge. This was a bridge with Binance because Binance was starting to eat Ethereum's launch. It's like DeFi summer, like very early days. There's been many posts like that, just with ideas. Most recently one, I had a vision for Boss. It was actually very nice to see someone both from your core and the new CTO at Pagoda respond to it. I've had tweets. I've sent two fiery ones today. And over time, I am in touch with people at the foundation, but I'm also mindful that there may be more people with ideas out there and we just want to activate the productive and the positive side of the community. The complaining is fine, but we want the people with ideas to be able to come forward. I think Nick, what's his name? Nick something. He's like rising pretty fast because he's coming in with those fresh lenses and seeing the potential. You know what I'm talking about? You you retweeted him recently. Yeah, Nick Nick Almond. That's who I met from the panel as well. Yeah, yeah. Amazing guy. Dr. Nick. Oh, oh, that Nick. Oh, he's great. Yeah, I love him. Yeah. Yeah, he's coming on for sure. We've got a winner. Amazing. I got to jump. Sir, I know that. But thank you so much for this. Super fun. Great talking with you. Great to have you on again. Thanks so much for your time. Cool. Bye. That's the end of another episode. As always, I just want to thank you for listening because let's be honest, you are amazing. And I also want to remind everyone that everything contained in this episode is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast shall be construed as financial, medical, or any other type of advice, and you should always consult with licensed professionals before making any financial decisions. Make sure that you like and subscribe so that you stay up to date with the latest episode. We've got a steamy hot pipeline of guests that will keep you entertained right through the bear market. Stay safe out there, and I'll see you soon. Bye.